like to hear that for a few minutes. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one. Welcome everyone and good morning. It's nice to see you all here this morning. God bless you today. Uh, order of the service for today. Welcome and announcements and I will try to remember to offer an opening prayer this morning. I failed in that task last week. We'll have our time of worship and singing. After that, the kids will be dismissed. Scott will be bringing our message this morning, followed by a special number, and then a closing prayer and dismissal. Some announcements for us this morning. A reminder that we have a men's group meeting um, every Sunday morning at 9.30, and all men are welcome for that. You don't have to be special, you don't have to be young, you don't have to be old. Um, you can be any of those things, and you can still attend. All, are well, all men are welcome for that. 9.30 on Sunday mornings. We are now into March, our missions of the month for March. The domestic mission will be the DAP, or the Domestic Action Projects Committee. That's right, right? Domestic Action Projects, yes. And our, our foreign mission will be the mission we have in Tecate, Mexico. So be mindful of those when you give this month, and also be mindful of them in prayer, please, each day as you think about the work they attempt to do. Under prayer requests, we want to continue to lift up Ron and Karen Wagner. Pray for, pray for them. Uh, I talked to Steve Pamer this morning. Most of you know that he's been in the hospital because he, had, he was diagnosed with blood clots in his lung. And he was optimistic. He thought that he would be able to be released tomorrow from the hospital. So let's continue to lift him up. I'm sure that could be a pretty scary experience. Uh, also, Barbara wanted to share for us, if you remember, she had asked us to pray. It's been months now, Barbara, when you asked us to pray for Derek. Um, he had a brain tumor that was very, very serious, very dire. Um, and she wanted to report to us that he is doing pretty well mentally. That physically he's, he's having challenges, but mentally he is doing very well. And she, the family wanted to express their thanks to us for praying for him. So let's continue to do that. Uh, a reminder that uh, in our series on prayer that we're doing on Wednesday night, it's been very exciting and very helpful, I think, for a lot of us. We'll be talking about chapter 7, which is a very difficult topic, and that is unanswered prayer. What happens when we pray and we don't get the answer that we're seeking from the Lord. So everyone is welcome for that. We'd love to see everyone here or on Zoom for that. A reminder, we do have a church service tonight at 6 p.m., I talked to my mom and dad, and I wrestle, I arm wrestled them a little bit for this because uh, someone in our congregation asked if perhaps they could share their testimony with the church, since maybe there's people who haven't heard it. I know Ben and Sydney haven't heard it, maybe. Yeah. So there's an audience of two at least, that, <laughs> assuming they're going to be here tonight. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope so. Okay. <laughs> so that will be a, a part of our service tonight if you would like to know where it all started. Um, feel free to come. We invite everybody to come tonight for that. And of course, this is their last Sunday with us, just so you're aware. They plan on leaving tomorrow morning, pretty early in the morning, for Phoenix. And if you could please lift them up as they travel. Also, Scott and David will be helping them drive. So let's be uh, mindful of all four of them. That's a pretty long stretch. They're not doing it all at once, though, from what I understand. And as Scott has always told me, if you ever feel tired driving, just rest one eye, and you'll feel a lot better. <laughs> it's probably the worst driving advice one can receive. But, um, are there any other announcements or prayer requests that I have not mentioned yet? Okay, let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want your name to be hallowed and lifted up, for you are holy. You are righteous, you are good, and you are our Father. We're thankful for that. We want your will to be done on earth here as it is done in heaven. We want to lift up our brother Steve to you as he is in the hospital. We know it's your will as you, your love for your children extends um, more deeply than we can imagine. We pray, God, for that Steve would feel secure, that he would feel safe, that he would start to feel stronger and healthy, that he would be encouraged, and that he would feel loved. We pray, God, as, as we miss him here this morning, that you would bring him back to our fellowship as soon as possible. We want to lift up to Ron and Karen Wagon. We pray for Ron's body and his state of mind and his health. We pray for Karen as she perseveres through this very difficult time as they both travel this road together. We pray, Lord, for your grace and your mercy upon them 
as a couple and that Karen would have sustaining mercy as she continues to care and be by Ron's side during this time. We praise you, God, for the work you have done in Derek's life. We ask, God, that you would get all the glory for that, that your healing power and that your intervention and intercession in his life would not go unnoticed. It would be a changing mercy in the lives of him, in the life of him, and the lives of those around him. We're thankful, God, for answered prayer. We're thankful for your faithfulness in that regard. We pray for our church. We ask, God, for our fellowship that you would protect it from the evil one and from the sin that so easily besets us, that we would be on solid ground, that our faith would have a sure foundation, and that we would be standing on the rock of Jesus Christ. We lift up Mom and Dad and Scott and David as they travel tomorrow to Phoenix. We ask God that you would protect them each step of the way, that there would be no engine troubles, no car troubles, that there would be um, safe driving, that they'd be able to stay awake, and that you would help them, Lord, to rejoice as they travel through your creation. We pray, God, your blessing on this time we have together now, that the message that's brought and the songs that are sung, we would truly be worshiping in spirit and in truth, and that we would learn and grow, that we would be moved by the Spirit, that we would be encouraged by the Spirit to allow Him to fill us up, that we would be able to be vessels and cups of your mercy as we go out into the world and as we interact with each other. We just pray, God, for your blessing on this time, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Good morning. Let's all stand. Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay.
children are dismissed. All right, how many were tapping your toes there as we were singing this morning? There's one hand, a couple hands. Hopefully that, uh, that is uh, something inspiring for us as we think about uh, this idea. We're here to worship, and we're here to celebrate. hard when people leave, and you're going to miss them. But the really cool thing that God has opened a door for John and Carla for a new chapter in their life. And the neat thing is that each of us that claim Christ, God opens doors, he closes doors, he creates new opportunities for us, and moves us to where he wants us to be. As much as we're going to miss John and Carla, I'm confident, and I know and believe, God's going to use them in some new avenue for his kingdom. I don't know what that looks like. They probably don't know what that looks like right now. There's probably a lot of question in their mind. But I know as a church body, we're going to be lifting them up in prayer that they figure that out and to know that. And luckily for me and for David also, we're going to have a couple extra days with John and Carla, and for that I'm, I'm thankful for. Okay, let's uh, get into our word that we're going to look at today. And I want to recap just a little bit, if you remember from last week. Uh, we looked at Acts chapter 2, and we looked at the idea of Pentecost, that day of Pentecost, and that idea of the spirit coming and residing with mankind. If you'll remember back, we looked at the word spirit in those uh, chapters was the word pneuma, which was one of the Trinity members, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That word the Holy Spirit is kind of what we looked at and what that meant as we looked at those verses. Um, we're going to see that word pop up again in today's scripture, so just kind of keep that in mind. When we see the word, it'll refer to as Holy Spirit or, or the Spirit. It is that word pneuma that's used over and over, and it's that idea of the Holy Spirit that's going to be in our lives. Um, God's Spirit, if you'll remember, was represented in our text by fire and by a wind and by enabled speech. And as we looked at some Old Testament scripture, we saw that God was in those things as well as in the future in the New Testament um, a representation of God and what he was doing. We looked at some of the Old Testament scripture that bore that out. We talked about the dry, the dry bones and how the breath or the wind or the spirit of God filled those bones and brought them back to life. We saw the fire in the burning bush that Moses had an encounter with God at the burning bush. And we also saw how Saul, as he was the newly appointed king, was enabled with his speech to be able to prophesy with a band of um, prophets as they were coming down from the, from a mountain. We saw that uh, the uh, that as Peter spoke uh, later to the crowd at the day of Pentecost, that he quoted some prophecy from Joel chapter two, and in that prophecy, um, Peter was saying it was the fulfillment of the idea of the Spirit of God now coming and re residing with man, with mankind. And we saw that um, the Holy Spirit was a gift promised by Jesus as we looked at Scripture. And we saw some different accounts as Jesus was on this earth that the Spirit was with him and the encounters with him. But he also told his disciples that unless he went away, the Spirit would not come. And that as he went away, that Spirit would be left as a gift for the believers. And that's the same gift that we have today, the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives and resides with us. It was also mentioned um, that living in the Spirit, living in the power of the Spirit, it changes lives. 
that living in the power of the Spirit, it changes communities. And that living in the power of the Spirit changes cultures. And if we as believers and Christians, those of us who call ourselves Christ followers, if we let that fill us up, we're going to have impacts in this world. And we're going to be able to allow God's Spirit to move us and to change things. I challenged uh, myself, as well as each of you, to examine the excuses we use for not letting Christ fill us to the fullest. Hopefully you've had a thought about that this week and been able to kind of dig deep and dig into your soul and understand and come to some sort of understanding of what some of those excuses are and why we let those um, take, let that take us away from having God's Spirit be completely filled in our lives. We're going to continue on today and came up with a really catchy title from last week. This is part two of Fill Me Up. Stop, don't throw the tomatoes at me. <laughs> so, um, as I've had a chance to read some articles the last uh, week and a half or so about some uh, articles of what it looks like uh, for a church to be spirit-filled, and I know that would be one of our goals here at the Woodstock Bible Church, is to have our church truly filled with the Spirit and operating in that way. Um, in, in, in a lot of these articles, I've seen a wide variety of ideas and thoughts about what it looks like um, to be a spirit-filled church. In an article written by Paul Chappell, he writes, the reason we do not always see the power in our churches today is because we tend to focus more on programs and action items than we do on seeking God's power. And isn't that true that as I've had opportunity um, through many years to visit different churches and, and um, not, not only AC churches, but churches outside of our AC normal groups that I've, I've been to. Um, there's been times when I've gone to churches and it's been more of a production show and it's been more of a, an idea of, well, we have all these programs going on and it almost seems like the focus has been lost of what it means to really be a spirit-filled church when all these other programs and ideas have been focused on and kind of the meaning of what Christ is in our life and the spirit in our life has lost its importance. There were a lot of thoughts and ideas floating around in these articles that I read, but I also noticed a few common themes as I looked through these different articles. And as I have been reading through the first half of the book of Acts, we can see some of these themes emerging in the early church. We're going to look at uh, Acts again today. We'll have a few other scriptures, but if you want to turn to, to chapter 2 again, we're, we're going to start there, and we're going to, we're going to turn through... a a fair amount of different chapters in Acts, in the first half of Acts, to look at some, some ideas. Let's start reading Acts chapter 2. At the end um, of that chapter, we're going to look at 42, starting there, and verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all these believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possession to give to one another who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As we stop and we look at this very first church that got together just right after the day of Pentecost when it said that 3,000 came to know Christ, we can see the community of believers coming together and all sharing in and around what had just happened in this idea. And I believe it was because of God's Spirit that came to these people. It, it motivated them and it encouraged them to do the things that they were doing. We look and we see that there were many awes and wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. Those things, as we think about that in today's day and age, as I stop and I think, I don't know that I've seen many signs and wonders and have really been in awe. I know I've had some of those experiences in my life. I can think in my younger years when there were times, uh, specifically I know when I was in Brazil, on a short-term mission, we saw some things happen that only could have happened because it was God working a miracle. But I think as we 
here in North America have so many conveniences and so many things readily available to us, we don't look for that miracle to happen. And sometimes we, we, the miracle happens and we don't even see it. And as I've, I've contemplated what it means when we're through our Wednesday night uh, prayer study that we've been doing, sometimes the things we pray for, we just take it for granted when at the end of the day it's happened. We don't even give God the credit for what happened. Um, those in and of themselves are miracles that are happening. We should stand in awe of how God works in those areas. They broke bread, they ate in their homes, and with glad and sincere, and sincere hearts, they praised God and enjoyed the favor of all people. We, in this time of COVID, have run through a time when we've been separated, when we haven't been able to get together. I long for those times. I know as a whole, our church, our AC churches, this Woodstock Bible Church, we've, we've enjoyed the company of people. We've enjoyed getting together to have meals. We've enjoyed getting together at people's houses and doing things. In the last year, we haven't been able to do that kind of interaction. I've missed it. I know you guys have missed it. The early church did it. God calls us to that. Acts chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. And this is when he was getting ready to heal um, a crippled man. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Take, taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gates, called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. And we know that this didn't happen just because Peter was a good guy. It didn't happen because he had special powers. We know that it happened because he had the spirit in him. And he was living a life with that spirit in him. And knowing what it meant to do that. And he was able to perform this miracle. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 Peter and John had just gotten out of jail, and, and it says on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and all that the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our Father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot against plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now the Lord considered their threats and enabled your servant to speak your words with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. We see that with the boldness, they were able to speak about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ had done in their lives. We see that it took that boldness because of the filling of the Holy Spirit that they were able to do that. And as they prayed and as they spoke and as they attested to that, we see that God's grace was powerfully at work in them all. And I stop and think just for a moment to Try to get a glimpse of what that may have been like to have been present at that early church back then and to know and understand it and put into context what it would look like to have God's grace powerfully at work in us here today. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put, aside, put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, 
Consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people to re in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But, it's, but if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And skip into verse 42. It says, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And if you stop and you think about this, there were uprisings back in that time of a new movement that was happening, very similar to what they looked at this new Christianity movement as. And those things failed. God was not in there. And in the wisdom of Gamaliel saying, if this is from God, you're not going to be able to stop it. You're just going to be pushing against God. And it's been, what, some 2,000 or more years from now, and we still see this Christian movement moving forward. We see God's spirit that started here working in the lives of people, still working in the lives of people in 2021. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I found this interesting, this idea of the priests who became obedient to the faith. Those people who were the, the viewed leaders, the priests of the time who you would have thought would have fallen in line with the Pharisees and with the Sanhedrin to be against Christ. It says many of the priests came to know Christ as well. The power in the spirit. They knew God spoke to them. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, in, it increased in numbers. And this idea of living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, we can see how the Spirit indwelt in their lives and the things that happened and brought about change, brought about conviction, brought about growth in the new Christians' lives. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who had scattered by the now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch, where he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. We can see as the church started being persecuted there in Jerusalem how it went out. And as it went out, it wasn't just the apostles that were doing the preaching. As they went out, we see they made an impact. Just regular people who were part of the early church went out, were able to convert people by speaking the good news of Christ. As we've read a handful of these scriptures and seen the presence, the idea, the motive behind the first church, we can see the spirit working in that first church. I believe there are some common themes throughout these scriptures that we read. One thing is that they met together. They had meals together. They surrounded themselves with sound teaching. They prayed powerfully, powerfully that the earth shook. They had fellowship. God's grace was at work in them all. They worshiped. They had unity. There were signs and wonders and healings and that they spoke boldly. As I think about a spirit-filled church, that list is the beginning to start thinking about what a spirit-filled church looks like. 
If you were to put it into a short paragraph, it might read something like this. The early church met together often. They surrounded themselves with sound teaching and prayer and immersed themselves in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They worshiped in spirit and truth and through the power of the Holy Spirit, many signs and wonders were performed and many people were healed of their infirmities. Through bold speaking of the gospel, many people became to know Christ. What else could we add to this list? Does a spirit-filled church in the year 2021 look different than the early church would have looked? Would modern conveniences remove things off of that list that we just spoke about? Would modern conveniences add things to that list that we just spoke about? And ultimately, I would ask, do the 61 of us that make up this Woodstock Bible Church see these traits at work in our church? <clears throat> Excuse me. Are these traits corporately in this church, do we see them at work? If our church body is collectively supposed, supposed to be spirit-filled, which I believe scripture calls us to as a corporate church, then it would also make sense that by extension to that, the individual members of this church body, of any church body, would also be spirit-filled. This is where it kind of gets personal, and if you're like me, it's oftentimes we don't want to go and look in those places because it puts the spotlight on me, it puts the spotlight on our lives individually, and it's where God and his word and the spirit living inside me moves me and shapes me to conform to his likeness, to have his spirit work in and through me. Oftentimes those are painful moments for us because it causes us to change and to be more Christ-like. Let's go back to the early church and look into some individuals' lives. We looked at the church as a whole. Let's look at some individual lives. I'm not gonna read the scriptures because we're short on time, but I'll give you the reference and just give a brief description. If you wanna write them down, I encourage you to look at them. Acts chapter 3, 11 through 16. Peter and John, they were speaking to the crowd as to why that crippled man was, was healed. We, we read that earlier. But they were able to speak boldly, and they were able to focus on Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ had done in their lives and had done for every person's life of why they were able to do that. In Acts chapter 4, again, Peter and John speaking before the Sanhedrin. It says, as they spoke to the Sanhedrin, that the Sanhedrin was amazed at their ability to speak. These, it says they were just ordinary men, but yet they had power, and that power came from the Spirit individually in them. Acts chapter 5, it says they preached the good news daily. Daily, every day, it was something that was in the forefront of their thoughts that the early church spoke to salvation. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, the account of Stephen and him being the first martyr, it talked again about his boldness of speech, I believe only brought about by him having the Spirit in his life. It said that his face was like that of an angel. And as he was being stoned to death, can you imagine, he says, forgive them. Lord, forgive them. What a testimony. Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian. How Philip was prompted by the Spirit to go run to the chariot and see this man. He didn't know anything about this guy, but heard the Spirit speak to him to go move and act, and he did, and we see what happens. The Ethiopian was baptized, came to know Christ. Acts chapter 9, after Saul had lost his sight and was in the upper room, we see Ananias, who knew about Saul. He was persecuting Christians. The Lord spoke to Ananias and says, go to Saul. You're going to heal him. Can you imagine being that person to know that I am being called to go to someone who's killing someone like me, but the obedience that he showed. Acts chapter 10, Peter's vision and his obedience to go to Cornelius, a Gentile. Nothing was unclean. Acts chapter 11, we see Barnabas and Saul who went to the church in Antioch. And it was in that first church in Antioch that they got the first name of Christians, that Christ was being preached. We could go on and this list could continue 
of instance after instance after instance of individuals' lives who were used and prompted by the Spirit to accomplish God's purposes. You might be thinking those are really good examples, but those guys you just mentioned are like the heroes of faith. They're like the major leagues of Christians, the big hitters. There's no way I could possibly live up to that in my Christian faith. And I might suggest to you that this morning, if you really thought about it and thought back to these people who, when put under trial, when asked to do something by Jesus, they fell asleep when they were asked to keep watch as Jesus went and prayed. When Jesus was arrested, poof, they disappeared. We're not part of the trial. We see time after time that in the early life of these people, there was failure after failure after failure. Is that any different than us sitting here today? We might say that. I can't do that. But God enables that. We see what God can do when we have willing people to serve Christ and let his spirit work in us. I think the key to seeing these ordinary people do extraordinary things as we would see it in scripture and as we look to individuals that we may have had experience with in our lives that do seemingly extraordinary things as just an ordinary person, the key is that they were filled with the Spirit and that they chose to live that out in their lives. I had that choice, and I don't always make that choice to let that happen in my life for whatever reason. But I know the Spirit helps me when I ask for that help. And you have the choice. You have the choice to fully let that Spirit fill you up and to not minimize the effects that He can bring into your life because we can do it. We're going to close things up here and... Um, I have uh, a little bit more that we need to speak about, but that'll happen next time when I come up here. But today, as we've been able to think about the early church and think about the fact that as we looked last week that the Spirit came and indwelt them and was part of their lives every day, we see the things that the church was able to accomplish. It wasn't on their own, though. They had to rely on the Spirit they had to rely on each other. They had to rely on the interactions. They had to rely on being around strong teaching. They had to rely on a strong prayer life. And they had to rely on a list of those other things that we talked about. They couldn't do it on their own. And it comes back to having Christ's Spirit fill us up. I want to encourage you individually as you think about that as well. Of Again, continue to let the Spirit speak to you and understand in your life what it is that He wants you to get rid of and fill back up with himself to accomplish his purposes in your life. And the next time that I speak, as I, I get up, I'm going to hopefully impart to you guys some practical ways that we can let that happen in our lives. That we just don't want to talk about it and say we need to do this, but we need to figure out a way that ultimately we can, as a church body and as individuals, let these things come into our life and be a part of who we are and be a part of who we are, not only as individuals, but as a church body as we impact the community that's around us, and as we impact the culture of this world of living for Christ. May the Lord bless this word this morning.
Let's all stand for a closing prayer. our service for this morning. God bless you all. Again, we welcome all of you back this evening for our evening service at 6.